We do have a very special guest with us this morning, Dr. Peter Williams. And um, I need to read his vitae because in, in and of itself, it is also a book. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Dr. Peter J. Williams is the principal and CEO of Tyndale House, Cambridge. He was educated at the University of Cambridge where he received his Master of Arts, Master of Philosophy, and PhD in the study of ancient languages related to the Bible. After his PhD, he was on staff in the Faculty of Divinity at the University of Cambridge and thereafter taught Hebrew and Old Testament as an affiliated lecturer in Hebrew and Aramaic at the University of Cambridge and research fellow in Old Testament at Tyndale House, Cambridge. From 2003 to 2007, he was on the faculty of the University of Aberdeen, Scotland, where he became a senior lecturer in New Testament and deputy head of the School of Divinity History. Those UK schools have the coolest titles, you know what I'm saying? And since 2007, he has been leading Tyndale House. Dr. Williams is also an affiliated lecturer in the Faculty of Divinity in the University of Cambridge, chair of the International Greek New Testament Project, and a member of the Translation Oversight Committee of the English Standard Version of the Bible, which is the one that uh, I read from. His book, Can We Trust the Gospels, has been translated into 13 languages. His latest book, The Surprising Genius of Jesus, what the Gospels Reveal About the Greatest Teacher was published in October 2023. Both of these books are available to you for free for a donation of any amount right out in the lobby. Will you please give an illuminate warm welcome for Dr. Peter Williams. Thanks for being here, buddy. Appreciate it. So we're just gonna kinda engage in uh, some dialogue here uh, with Peter, and I thought what I would do is start with a fundamental question, okay? Uh, the fact of the matter is we live in what's been termed a post-truth world, post-truth environment. It's the idea that facts are less influential than feelings. Does that make sense? And so that being the case, that being the prevailing ethos of our time, maybe the fundamental place to start is, what difference does it make? Why is it so important to even ask this question in the first place? Can we trust the Gospels? Are they reliable? Yeah. Well, it's great to be here. Um, on this whole question of facts, I think people um, have different views. They are very concerned about the facts on their payslip, so they, they don't want to be relativistic about that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to other things, people want to be able to choose their own facts. Right. So, uh, I mean, a good example of this is, um, one level, it doesn't matter what facts you believe, because we're all quite comfortable. If you believe the Earth is flat, right, if you really want to believe that, mm -hmm. it's not going to hurt your life too much nowadays. Um, really, I'm not suggesting you should do it. I'm just saying, so you can choose your own dietary theory. You'll probably never actually be proven, proven wrong. And then during the pandemic, and I don't want to get into the politics of that, but what for me it was, was for, it, for, it was a mirror, right? Because everyone could choose their own experts just to reflect back to them exactly what they wanted to have as a take on that, right? So in other words, and, and sometimes you do bump up against a fact, and that, that, that can be really awkward. Um, but that's a bit of an issue nowadays, that we are so comfortable in the Western world that we can afford to be relativistic about facts sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if God, who made the universe, has spoken and revealed himself in a particular person, coming in the person of Jesus Christ at one particular time, and that's been reported in four Gospels, and that's how God wants you to know him, you can't afford to be relativistic about that. It really matters, because if you miss that, you're going to miss out on the relationship with God. You're going to miss out on salvation. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to sort of wake ourselves up out of the relativism that we, we can put ourselves into a lot of the time and realize, no, it really does matter. It matters what I think of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I mean, I've often said that God has this way of baking reality into the nature of human existence. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, you're going to bump up against yeah, it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some people will say that, uh, again, especially in our day and age, that it, uh, well, religion is for, much like Karl Marx said, religion is, is, is sort of that crutch, it's the opiate of the masses. Um, it's just here to make people feel better about, and the world that we live in is certainly 
mixed up and sideways, so much darkness. It's just a way for people to, to feel better yeah. about themselves, the context, the world. It is, you know, so sort of that, those, those rose-colored lenses. Um, is religion the opiate of the masses, and is he right, if, is he wrong? Uh, how does it relate to our, our topic at hand? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if Marx is accusing Christianity of being a really good story, guilty, mm-hmm. yeah, certainly yeah. is, and of giving people hope, mm-hmm. yeah, um, people hope in all sorts of things nowadays. People can hope in drugs. People can hope in this, that, and the other. Um, so it, saying that Christianity took off because it's a crutch, that won't work with the early Christians. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to be gained career-wise uh, from being one of those early Christians. It tends to shorten your life. It tends to make your uh, life uh, end quite painful and so on. So that's why it won't really explain uh, how... Christianity got going. And what we want to say is that Christians can have a whole... The the Christian church is the most uh, ethnically diverse and and other ways diverse uh, movement on the planet. Mm -hmm. You're trying to sum up all of the different experiences of all these people across every country on the planet Mm -hmm. as these people are all looking for a crutch. But we've got people at the top of life, the Mm -hmm. people at the bottom of life, every single place in between represented in the church is that does it really explain something to say that that's what they're all after Mm -hmm. um if it if it were a simple explanation like we would expect there just to be one particular psychological profile and segment of people that would come to christian faith that won't work because look you're all quite different right yeah I, i people will often say to me I'm drawn to Christianity because I want to be inspired. And I understand what they mean by that, but I'm quick to say, well, you, what should draw you to Christianity is the fact that it's the truth. Mm-hmm. It's true. You don't come to Christianity yeah. because you want to be a better person. It'll yeah. make you a better person. Yeah. But you come to Christianity because it's true. Those are two very, yeah. Yeah. very different things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what are the Gospels, and, uh, and, and how, how did we get them? So there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and they're in every Bible. Uh, so it doesn't you know, matter whether it's a Catholic, a Protestant Bible, whatever, they, they, they are there. They're the four Gospels. Uh, and they are about nine hours long um, between them. So that, that's all four. And they're all accounts of Jesus' life that are from the first generation of Christians. Not talking about the actual date they come from, because they... Um, but they, they come from people within one generation of Jesus, and we can tell that from the, mati- from the, the, the way they're telling the story, uh, the way they get things, uh, so many things right, the patterns in there. We can go into that in a moment. Um, two of them, Matthew and John, are by eyewitnesses, and uh, Luke and Mark are by people who did lots of interview with eyewitnesses. Mm-hmm. And they each tell you a story of uh, this remarkable character, um, Jesus, and about a third of each of those is, or quarter, is focused on his death and resurrection. And I just think no one could make up the person of Jesus. Uh, mm-hmm. The things he said, uh, it, it's just, uh, yeah, you, that, that couldn't really happen. So they are really important, and you should study them really carefully all your life. Yeah. You could dig a little bit deeper into the authors themselves. Yes. Because the, the word synoptic is often used. Maybe yep. you can explain the significance of that. Yeah, so there are three Gospels, <coughs> Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are more similar to each other than uh, John, mm-hmm. uh, they, they are to John. And they have some uh, interesting patterns. So there's quite a lot of stuff that you get in Matthew and Luke uh, and not in Mark. And then you get things that are in all three. And you get things that are only in Matthew and things that are only in Luke, and and then you get different patterns of overlap. So what that means is, although you've got four Gospels, you've actually got over six types of material in there, and you can study the uh, mutual relationships. And what you find when you're looking at patterns of reliability, as I do, the idea that one person could make up a story and this could all take off doesn't really account for... uh, the patterns that you've got in the Gospels, because you've got six and more types of basic material in there, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So if, um, when I'm looking at, say, um, there's something that's only in Matthew, which is where it says, Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine, uh, uh, don't, and go give what's holy to the dogs. Um, and that was a really interesting thing, because he talks about pigs and dogs, 
uh, and that's in Matthew 7, and then over in uh, Luke chapter 15, and something that's only in Luke chapter 15, uh, you've got uh, this story of a runaway son who is then feeding the pigs, and it said he longed to be filmed with the things that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. And then in the very next chapter, Jesus is telling a story about a rich man and Lazarus, and how Lazarus longed to be filmed with the f- food that fell from the rich man's table, and along mm-hmm. came the dogs. So you've got exactly the same pattern that longed to be filmed with in two stories, one pigs, one dogs. So it's the same mind mm-hmm. in Luke, and the same mind in Matthew, thinking about these unclean animals in Jewish contexts, pairing them together, but they're actually saying different things. Mm-hmm. And that's the, uh, you only really get that pattern if it all goes back to the same person in the first place. You can't explain that, oh yeah, Luke copied Matthew, or Matthew copied Luke. That won't help mm-hmm. explain that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. There, <clears throat> I know when I was you know, initially investigating these things, I graduated from Arizona State University, mm-hmm. and I think that some of my professors did everything they could to try to derail me. Um, but in, in the end, it actually ended up strengthening me. They actually had me read a book by Bertrand Russell called Why I'm Not a Christian. Yeah. I finished reading that book and thought, I have to be a Christian. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I literally right. thought that because, yeah. because of, he was writing this book about how we don't need God to give us any sense of morality just before Hitler rolled through Europe you know, together with millions of Germans saying the right thing to do is to exterminate the Jews. And so yeah. I thought, well, that would fall apart. Um, but there, 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 there is a sense, many will say, well, how do you know the Bible is true? Well, because the Bible says it's true. Well, that's circular reasoning. Talk to us about the, the significance of the extra biblical literature, that is to say, those things outside of the Bible that uh, lend to the veracity of the scriptures themselves, the truthfulness of it. Yes, yeah, so from outside the Bible, we can establish many things, um, and you can establish that Jesus existed in Tacitus, who's a Roman historian, who will tell you that Christ was put to death at the time of Pontius Pilate in Judea. So it's round, um, and we know that Pontius Pilate was governor from the year 26 to the year 36. So we know the period in which it happened. We know where it, um, it, it took place. And that's getting that from a non-Christian source. From the Jewish sources, you can learn that Jesus died on the eve of Passover, just like you find in the Gospels. So you know that um, he died at the, um, the capital of, of, of the Jews uh, at this most significant time of the whole year mm-hmm. uh, when they're celebrating their greatest um, mm-hmm. uh, event in their, own t- in, their, in their history, the, the, the Exodus from Egypt. So you can find that stuff from outside the New Testament. Already that's pretty remarkable in terms of what you've got about Jesus. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this idea. I, I, I remember early on discovering that no reputable historian doubted that there was a Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. And then you have to kind of determine, okay, is he who he says he is? And then that focuses on the resurrection. Uh, at that point, I think every thinking person should be asking the question, why is Christianity a thing? You know what I'm saying? Why is it even here? Yep. You know, everything seemed to be against it. Uh, at the time, and yet something happened that took it from this, this literally this fledgling movement yep. to say, I mean, even the earliest followers of Jesus were kind of huddled together going, this is bad, they killed our leader, what's yep. next for us? And then something happened that just sort of fanned Christianity into flame. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so in sort of marketing terms, Christianity looks like it's just going to get nowhere totally. because um, the central message that God himself became human, I mean, the, trying to market that amongst Jews is yeah, going to be that's, really it's over. tough. Yeah. The, the, and then the idea that someone who was shown publicly by the Roman Empire to be a loser by being crucified mm-hmm. is somehow victorious. Yeah. Again, good luck. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, so in marketing terms, it just shouldn't take off at all, but it does. And I think that's because the resurrection really happened. Mm-hmm. And then you've got this remarkable thing that it seems that the, the early Christians were really quite cowardly uh, and right. they all abandoned uh, mm-hmm. uh, Jesus. So they don't look like the sort who are going to be taking over the world, and mm-hmm. yet it does, and, and that's been happening ever since. It's not been... Christians are remarkable people, but um, <laughs> it's not been because Christians have been remarkable that the message has spread. Yeah. Well, and you have to appreciate the soberness with which the Scriptures are written, and the honesty, because there's this lie that gets perpetuated. You know, the body's not there. What happened? Well, Tell people the body was stolen. Mm-hmm. 
you know, but obviously that's a near impossibility yeah. in its time because of everything that was happening around that scene. The tomb was, was sealed, and, and, and people wanted, I always say, people, if you wanted to put an end to Christianity, all you have to do is parade Jesus' dead body around the streets on day four. Yeah. It didn't happen. Yeah. yeah, so with the resurrection, the way I would put the argument is <clears throat> you've got a combination of two things coming together. One is the empty tomb, and two is lots of different sorts of people saying they've seen Jesus risen from the dead by morning, uh, um, by evening, in the town, out of town, indoors, out of doors, by prior appointment, without prior appointment, groups of men, women, and so on. And Jesus is talking, and, uh, and so that's going on. Lots of people claiming they've seen Jesus risen from the dead, and the body's missing. Now, those two things in themselves would be remarkable. But when you put that together, then with the remarkable person of Jesus, this is the person who came up with amazing stories that we tell nowadays and found very powerful, who said, came up with things like, those who live by the sword will die by the sword, a house divided against itself can't stand, um, do unto others what you'd have them do to you. Some of the um, judge not that you be not judged, turn the other cheek. These are all really epic things in themselves. Like, one of those quotations should be enough to make you famous, right? Mm -hmm. And that he came up with loads of them, mm -hmm. and there are reported miracles, and there are all these stories. And you think, how can you have all that in one person? So it's not just that the body is missing of any random person. It's that that's happened to someone who is very particular, who dies on the eve of the greatest um, Jewish festival, near their capital, who comes from this remarkable people group in the first place, who chose 12 disciples that seems to be really symbolic, number like the 12 mm -hmm. tribes of Israel, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Born in Bethlehem, which seems to be prophesied that a great king is be going to be on there. And you start putting it all together and you start saying, what if Jesus is actually forming the pattern? Rather than it being like miracles break patterns, you know, normally it's nice, life is nice and ordinary, and then miracles like spoil um, that. What if Jesus is actually making the pattern? What if he's the ordering principle mm -hmm. um, uh, for making sense of life? Mm -hmm. Then suddenly these things do make sense. It, it, it makes me think of that. I, I, I don't know if it originated with C.S. Lewis or if he just popularized it, but that Lord, liar, lunatic yeah, yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and when you examine the, the sayings, the teachings of Jesus, these are not the words of a lunatic. Yeah. Because it turns out these are, these are the most profound things that have mm -hmm. ever been said in human yeah. history. And to your point, one after another, not just one or two. Um, a little bit of a deviation because this isn't, uh, it's basically the, the story of your second book. Unpack that a, a little bit more for us because the title of that book is The Surprising Genius yeah. of Yeah, uh, so there's copies that side. Uh, and... Um, that, half of that book is about Luke chapter 15, which is just this yeah. story, which is about three minutes long, of, of the two sons, the runaway uh, son and uh, the older brother, 62% about the younger brother and uh, 38 about uh, the older mm -hmm. one. And what's so striking there is that it's said in Luke to be told to four groups of people, tax collectors, sinners, scribes, and Pharisees. So tax collectors are interested in taking your money. Sinners are interested in sin enough to get it like, as their label. Um, uh, Pharisees are people who separate from sin, so mm -hmm. exactly the opposite, and scribes copy out the scriptures and know them really well. So one group, you, uh, two, two groups you don't expect to know the Bible well, two groups you expect to know the Bible super well. Jesus tells a story which will work if you don't know the Bible at all. So this story of a man has two sons, the younger one goes to him and says, Father, give my share of the inheritance. He gives it to them, he divides it to them, both of them, the older and the younger brother. Younger brother then goes off and wastes his life, and then he um, comes round and realizes that his father's hired servants have a, a, a better life. He, he, he comes back, and the father runs, embraces, and kisses him. And that's the first 60%, uh, and there's a big feast. Now, then the older brother's really resentful of this. Um, and what's really interesting is that story maps onto the book of Genesis in a remarkable way. So, when you say a man had two sons, if you're thinking as a Bible expert, there's only one man who had two and only two sons in the Bible who's really famous, and that's Isaac. And he had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And remember how Jacob cheated his older brother Esau out of the inheritance. Esau is therefore so angry that Jacob has to go off into a far country 
feeds animals, he then comes back. And there's only one place in the entire Bible it says that someone runs, embraces, and kisses someone. And that is Genesis 33, verse 4, where Esau runs, embraces, and kisses his younger brother who's cheated him out of his entire inheritance. And Jesus grabs that bit of the story, and he makes that what the father does. And the older brother, who has done really well, because guess what? The older brother should be really pleased with younger brother, because the younger brother has done the dirty work, asking dad for the inheritance. As a result, older brother has got probably twice what the younger brother got, because that's what happens in Old Testament law. He's got an advance on his inheritance, and now he owns the farm. He's done really well. He should be saying, bro, I love you. If ever you need a favor, just ask me what it is. <laughs> but in fact, said he's fuming angry, <laughs> telling his dad, you never gave me a young goat when he gave him a farm. You know, <laughs> and so that's a really powerful bit of the story. But it's not just the story of Jacob and Esau. A man had two sons, might remind you, of Abraham uh, having uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Abraham's the only other person who gave away his inheritance while he's still alive, but he only gave it to the younger one, to Isaac, because the older one despised the feast for the younger one. In fact, when you read that the father runs in the story, there's only one other old man in the Bible you can remember running. That's Abraham when he's 99. In Genesis chapter 18, he has three guests come along, and he runs towards them. The first word from his mouth to Sarah, quick. That's the first words from the father's mouth in the story. So you can see it's actually mapping on to Genesis. And this is happening with loads of the bits of the stories. So it's got layers and layers and layers in there. Mm -hmm. And what that shows is a number of things. Firstly, it's a brilliant story. Um, You have to be totally amazing to come up with such a story. It's three minutes long. So you get loads in a short story that's really powerful and that will work in any culture. That's pretty amazing. But also you know that the whole lot, every single word, has to come from Jesus. Because you can't get brilliant stories by committee. Uh, the whole genius has to come from one person. It all has to be handed down correctly. And it all has to be given to the people it says it was told to in the first place in Luke chapter 15. Otherwise it wouldn't make sense why he's got all the Old Testament references in if he's not talking to scribes. Mm -hmm. So all of those things come together. I mean, I I lay that out in a little bit more in in this little book. That's great insight. I wish I would have come up with it. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's good stuff. No, that, that, but that, that, uh, just the, the, the the description of someone running at that age, all of a sudden the reader's taken back because it, you know, as I understand it, it was considered undignified for old men to run because you should have all your affairs in order Absolutely. And, you know, and old men aren't in a hurry to, to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And yet there's this running that yeah. harkens back to exactly what you said. Well, that just tells you the father's heart yeah. in that situation, what he's willing to overcome uh, to, to do that. So um, what, um, what, what would you say to, to someone who says, because I, I, I receive this a lot, especially from the younger generation, and certainly social media influence here, but there is information bias in every direction. Sure. In every direction, you know, and, yeah. and now the algorithms will train you to think yeah. a certain way. So uh, h- how do you begin to discern uh, fact versus fiction yeah. when you're trying to think these things through, when you're just beginning? Yeah, so I think at one level it, it, it's right uh, that there's sort of can be information bias in loads of different things. Um, But you can't then say, well, I'm not going to do anything. You decide to do something with your day every day. Um, And so you have uh, beliefs that you default to. And often what happens is people question what they find inconvenient, Mm -hmm. and then they don't question what they find convenient. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do with the news sources. We choose Mm -hmm. the news channels we like, uh, and we don't uh, Mm -hmm. want to question them. But when something comes we don't like, we interrogate it. Now, what we can find remarkable as a pattern in the Bible, not just the Gospels, is um, this whole question of, take the Old Testament, which is the national literature of the Jews. There's no national literature on the planet that says as much negative about the people group from which it originates Mm -hmm. as the uh, national literature of the Jews. And then what does the, what do the Gospels say about the people from whom they originate? They say that all of the leading followers of Jesus, abandoned him and left him alone at his hour of greatest need. 
So what you can say is it doesn't seem that there's a sort of bias in terms of looking, trying to portray the early Christians as good. Mm -hmm. And there is this consistent theme running through the Bible, which we can see explains life, which is that humans are sinful, okay? Everyone except for Jesus Christ is sinful. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the biggest pieces of data on the planet. So, you know, people talk about this and that denial nowadays. One of the biggest forms of denial there is is sin denial, where people actually don't see that this Mm -hmm. is just across human nature, across political spectrums, Mm -hmm. sin is just everywhere. And that's Mm -hmm. one of the biggest things you need to explain and reckon with and solve. Um, Thankfully, God solved it for us. But Mm -hmm. but you have to wrestle with that. Mm -hmm. The reality of sin, and the Bible embraces that head on and says it's really deep, doesn't Mm -hmm. try and downplay it. That's why you need the really big solution of God himself coming Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. to take the price of our Mm -hmm. sins Mm -hmm. on himself. And it is universal because I think that's part of the challenge when you're trying to teach or preach in a postmodern age. It's like you never hear the word sin. Yeah. You know, but that is the reason why the world is so messed up. And, and yeah. sin is always out there. It's always yeah. the person that's a little bit worse than I am, yeah, yeah. you know? But it's like, how many times have you broken the Ten Commandments today before noon? <laughs> you know, those are difficult things for, for people to accept today. There's, um, the, the, the famous illustration is given uh, of the game Telephone, mm-hmm. which I'm sure yeah, you're yeah. familiar with. Yeah. Uh, so do you guys understand that concept of telephone? It's like someone tells you a story, you tell it to the person sitting next to you, they take the story and tell it to the person sitting next to them, and then a mere 10 people later, that story is completely, it's lost all integrity. It's a completely different story. Well, how, we take that same idea and apply it to the scriptures. How do we know, Peter, yeah. that something you know, even if some kind of significance hasn't been mistranslated or lost yep. along the way. How, how can we be assured of that? Yeah, so you could have something that happened less than an hour ago being misreported or something that happened 400 years ago being mm-hmm. correctly reported. Mm-hmm. So um, that's one of the things we've got to reckon with. But what we've got to remember about the telephone game, and people try and use this as an analogy for, the, for how the things got into the Gospels, is the telephone game is a game that's set up deliberately with really strict rules. You have to whisper. Shouting's not allowed. You're only allowed to say it once to one person, and there better be more than two of you playing it. You better actually make sure you've got, oh, 10 people to play it. You don't just play it with three. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it's a game which has stacked everything in favor of getting the message corrupted so that we can then laugh at how that happened. Mm -hmm. That's not a real-life situation. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely artificial right the way through. And what we've got with the Gospels is we've got uh, someone who is really famous and really public, and we have lots of channels of information for Jesus coming through. And when we look at, again, the patterns of information that we've got in the Gospels, we clearly can see those channels, and we can see ways of checking things. Um, And so... It doesn't seem to me a really good analogy at all. I think a much better analogy would be people shouting uh, mm-hmm. some message and lots of people shouting it, and, mm-hmm. and, and that's g- going to mm-hmm. spread uh, pretty well. So, um, yeah, I think it's a very artificial analogy. Mm-hmm. I, I love that because even the post-resurrection appearances, at one time Jesus appeared to something like over 500 people at yep. once, and some are still alive, yep. he says. By the way, if you want to go fact-check me, go ahead. Yeah, they're sure, still definitely. alive, go, yeah. go ask them. If it, they'll deny it, and then this whole narrative is dead in the water. Uh, so you got to love that honesty. Um, speaking of that, why do you think there aren't too many post-resurrection appearances included in Mark's account? Okay, yeah, great. Um, well, I mean, each, each gospel's different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I understand it, Mark's gospel ends quite suddenly at chapter 16, mm-hmm. uh, uh, verse 8. Um, but it tells you Jesus is risen from the dead, mm-hmm. uh, and the focus is on going out and, and, and spreading that uh, message. <sighs> One of the great things about a gospel is that it doesn't have to tell you everything because there are other things in the other gospels. Um, 
so Mark also doesn't tell you that Jesus was born, but he right. presumably was. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, and you find he was in other Gospels. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you don't have to say everything. And what's remarkable is that although they're biographies, they focus so much on one particular period in Jesus' life. They, Mark won't tell you what Jesus was doing when he was 20. Mm -hmm. well, a couple more questions. Um, well, let me ask you this. Is there, is there anything that we've missed that you think needs to be said in terms of the pers persuasive case to be made for the reliability of the Gospels? Anything we uh, haven't talked about that you think should be should be? I think about? there are lots of things that are often <laughs> details mm -hmm. which you can get within the Gospels, and it's worth looking at how Gospels dovetail with each other. So I'll just give you one illustration. But there are lots of these. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, just before Jesus uh, is crucified, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. And then, but not my will, but yours. In John's Gospel, that is, the prayer isn't recorded at all. People come to arrest Jesus in John's Gospel. Peter draws a sword and Jesus says, Put your sword back in the sheath. Should I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? That saying is not in the other Gospels. Why does he say cup at that point? That's really weird. But if you realize he's just been praying about the cup passing from him, it suddenly makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of way that details in one Gospel fit with another mm -hmm. one. It shows you this is what happens when people are truly reporting um, sections, different sections of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. and, and this extends to the Old Testament, too, right? <coughs> I mean, it's like as, as these prophets were speaking about a forthcoming Messiah, the way yep. I describe it is they had all these puzzle pieces, and then you get to the New Testament, and those gospel accounts, all of a sudden those puzzle pieces come together, yep. and the face on the box is Jesus, with, yep. without a doubt. I mean, if we're not yep. talking about Jesus, who are we talking about, you know, just in terms of the fulfilled prophecies, so, yeah. Um, it's one thing to sit up here and to sort of detail some of the, articulate some of the um, reasons, the facts behind why Christianity makes sense, why we should trust the Gospels. That's one form of evidence, but there are several forms of evidence that are in support of the reliability of the Gospels. And it's very, very difficult to argue a transformed life. And that's one of the things we like to do here at Illuminate. We love to celebrate and remember the fact that God is in the business of changing lives. And so today also happens to be Baptism Sunday. I've said that we are, as a staff, the most unconsciously competent group of people you'll ever meet because we never plan this well in advance. But the fact that Peter is here sharing his heart and bringing this side of the equation, and then uh, you're gonna hear from some people. In fact, we've got some folks in each one of the services today that are gonna give witness to the fact that the Gospels are so true that they have revolutionized people's lives. So we're gonna turn our attention to that next, but before we do, will you please give a great warm hand to the team. Thank you, Thank you brother. And will you pray with me? Father, we're just grateful for what you have secured for us. Christianity is by no means a blind faith at all. I pray for those that might be in the room and maybe in some way, just even in some small way, their hearts and their minds may be opened in a way that hasn't been opened before, Lord. That's the work of your spirit and the result of your good word. And most of all, the good work of Jesus on the cross, transforming lives. We thank you for these folks that are gonna be sharing in each of our services today. Pray for a special hand of blessing upon them. All for your glory we pray, in Christ's name, amen.